Hi, um, welcome to the session on accounts receivable. Today we'll discuss about the disposition of accounts receivable, factoring of accounts receivable. In the previous session, we discussed about the accounts receivable, in which um, we discussed about the treatment of accounts receivable in the financial accounts doubtful rates treatment of doubtful rates based on income statement approach balance sheet approach i will discuss um, um, about how we recognize the rece receivables in our uh, notes in our financial statements we'll have to um, uh, you know um, recognize the notes receivable accounts receivable separately both both are receivables trade receivables okay we classified receivables into trade receivables and non trade receivables okay these these are all receivables but they are all to be categorized like non trade receivables are to be categorized separately trade receivables are to be categorized separately so customers who need to extend the payment period okay they give oral promise it becomes accounts receivable any written promise it becomes notes receivable so when you are recording receivables on the financial statements you should clearly mention what is the amount of trade receivable and what is the amount of non trade receivables if a uh, trade receivable amount is a certain amount is uh, arrived at then further classify into accounts receivable and notes receivable also mention high risk or new customers because high risk customers need to be uh, okay observed from time to time same like new customers and you need to show a separate uh, you know uh, heading or loans to you know our employees and any subsidiary companies any money received receivable from the sale of assets investments etc should also be recorded any lending transactions like notes receivable and all notes payable notes payable on current liabilities notes receivable on accounts receivable should be recorded separately now short term long term so if uh, you have any um, uh, receivables receivables in the form of a note we should see that whether it is a short term or you know long term if it is a short term period you should write the face value in the financial reports and if you need any allowance to be provided of course you can provide but if you have any long term receivables that that need to be converted back into present value we don't have any present value calculations here in uh, your uh, you know syllabus so you no need to worry about the present values only the face value that to get a fair value fair value means the uh, sorry the uh, historical value historical value means the actual amount of transaction you no need to worry about these transactions now disposition of accounts receivable disposition of accounts receivable okay accounts receivable or notes receivable if we, if a company is in the short you know uh, requirement of money the accounts receivable or notes receivable must be converted into cash before they become due so say for example we sold goods for with 45 days credit but we can't wait until 45th day we are, we are not we are in the need of cash now we have accounts receivable in our you know books or notes receivable we can't go and ask the customers to whom we sold on 45 days credit it's been just 5 days 10 days one week okay one month still we have you know credit period in that case we can dispose this of to a third party say your company your company then you have uh, uh, say credit transactions credit transactions means you sold your goods 
on credit it can be either accounts receivable or notes receivable okay these amounts are you know outstanding say for 45 days now you 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 are in the need of money your company is in the need of money so these receivables open receivables or you know uh, notes receivables can be sold to a third party like xyz bank you have invoices contracts of receivables with you or you have some documents issued by your customers for uh, uh, extending the credit like a check post dated check or a promissory note that you can you know hand hand it over to a third party here i mentioned xyz bank this is called disposition so before you receive money or before the money becomes due you are selling the receivables to a third party and you encash it what are the reasons for disposition of you know the uh, uh, accounts receivable see we have to give credit but we lose interest or we are in need of money we have requirements etc or the reasons for disposition of accounts receivable there can be a competition this is the reason why you have to sell long credit period 90 days 90 days credit period but you you need in 10 days time you need money in 10 days time you can't wait for the further you know 8 day, 80 days so what you do is you sell the goods to your customer but sell the customer balance to someone else you have a customer and you have a factor factor is a person who buys your receivables it's you here you are selling the goods to your customer but selling the receivables to your factor that is called disposition okay we are selling goods to the customer but selling receivables to a factor and the reasons for this are like competition because of competition you may have to sell the goods longer period um immediate cash requirements we need money to meet our ends okay credit sales credit sales we don't want to you know show credit sales in our uh, books because it costs us collection legal charges etc imbalance cash cycle the requirement of cash like daily requirement of cash is a 5 million we are in the, we are in, at you know a uh, collection amount of 4.5 million so there is a requirement of daily 500000 so receivables are there in our books but not in the form of cash so what we need to do is to make our cash cycle for you know healthy we may have to sell some of the receivables okay to 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 have the cash su sufficient cash for day to day, day transactions not only that uh, loan covenants loan covenant means the terms and conditions as you agreed with the bank at the time of taking loan say when you borrow money from banks banks ask us to sign so many you know terms conditions one of them may be you should maintain a good liquidity means cash balances so that whenever emi becomes due uh, installment becomes due cash is ready so that bank can collect that amount from your account okay the the um, um, bank may put a condition that your borrowing facility is already full so you cannot borrow from the other banks bank may also tell you that restrict you that you can sell the goods but not exceeding 90 days or not exceeding 60 days or 45 days so when you sign an agreement while borrowing money for 45 days your receivables cannot go for 60 days or 90 days and when you present your financials to the bank showing your performance bank ask your audit reports from time to time so they see that uh, what is the aging of receivable if anything goes beyond 45 days they may question that why this is still not collected we lent you money but if your business goes into a problems then we lose our money therefore you have to follow the 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 restrictions terms and conditions what we had 
between us at the time of borrowing got it so this is a loan covenant so for this reason companies may sell receivables before they become overdue so here now you are selling the receivables to third party whether you sell this receivables to third party with a secured borrowing or sale of receivables secured borrowing means you give your accounts receivable or trade receivables or no sorry notes receivables and borrow money or you will sell your accounts receivable and notes receivable secured borrowing is on the basis of the the, the you know collateral given as accounts receivable documents or notes receivable it is an outright sale okay so transfer of this receivables can be accomplished by secured borrowing or sale of receivables credit card sales when a, a company uses a credit card transactions it is nothing but you know the factoring why because a uh, customer customer uses customer uses credit card it's your company customer uses credit card for the services or goods sold to the customer the customer's bank will pay you customer's bank credit card bank will pay you so customer is not directly paying it is nothing but a form of you know the factoring factoring means you are selling your receivables to bank say for example um, when you made a transaction of say five thousand dollars of selling your goods customer settles this amount by paying or paying by credit card and uh, you have a transaction of five thousand dollars here you will get this money in two or three working days from customer's bank say customer is mr a customer bank is xyz your company your company made a transaction of selling the goods of five thousand dollars to customer a customer a used a credit card we need money here so what happens is this info info will go to the banker banker will pay you say four thousand sometimes it is deducted at the rate of say 2% 2.5% 3% 3.5% 3 depending upon the bank card you know 150 so you will get 4850 so this 150 is towards commission to the bank paying you now so this this is the charge to us your company okay there will be some costs but you will get cash here second day or third day as per the working days so when you are factoring your receivables when you are factoring the receivables once a transaction for sale is done we uh, generate an invoice then we sell the invoice to third party okay so it means that you are selling goods to a customer raising an invoice now sell the invoice to someone else we receive the payment then factor collects the payment and we receive the final amount what is this say let me explain you we sold goods to a for say ten thousand dollars but a said i can only pay in 90 days time we sold goods to a for ten thousand we raised an invoice for ten thousand now we are selling this invoice to xyz bank we are factoring this xyz bank says we will retain this 20 percent now we will give you only 80 percent the factor xyz bank says we will pay you only 80 percent of this amount so we will receive 8000 and we will pay interest on 8000 we may uh, have to pay some you know commission on this 10000 as well collection charges or commission or commitment fee whatever factors fee so that factor fee and interest is to be deducted from this amount we'll get this net amount once the xyz bank collects money 
from our customer A, the remaining 20% will be paid on that date. $2,000 will be paid after factor collects money from our customer. So there are three steps involved here. Once you sell the goods, step one. Two, you are selling the receivables, factoring the receivables, step two. And you receive the final payment, the balance payment, step three. Okay, step A is just normal accounting recording. Customer account, debit, sales account, credit. Step two, it is getting finance using our accounts visible as a collateral. Cash account debit, factoring charges debit, interest account debit, okay? And uh, factor company, you can write factor companies or accounts visible. Then final money received, okay? Cash account debit, factors account credit. Let me show you the calculations here with an example. Say for example, a factor purchases of uh, purchase our company uh, credit sales of 120,000. This is a monthly due amount, one month due amount. We get this money within a month, but we need money now. The factor will uh, advance up to only 80%, not full amount. The remaining 20% will be paid after the factor collects from our customer. And the annual charge is 14%. This is annual charge. Yearly interest rate is 14%. Not only that, 1.5% of factor fee on the receivables purchased. Receivables purchased, not receivables factored. Factored amount will be 96,000. 80% of 120,000. This factor fee is on the receivables purchased. Now let me show you how much money we'll collect when this 120,000 is factored. First of all, 120,000, we need to charge interest for, you know, uh, one month. So 120,000 is the total amount, but financed amount is 80%, 96,000. This 96,000 is financed for one month period times 14% is annual charge. But what we need to do is times one divided by 12 because it is one month. If it is two months, two divided by 12, okay? So one divided by 12, 1,120 should be reduced. So the interest is deducted upfront in advance. Not only that, not only that, uh, the factor is also collecting some factor fee. But remember, factor fee is to be collected on, uh, charged on the full, full amount of accounts receivable, irrespective of the time period, times 1.5%. That is 1,800. 1,800 towards the factor fee and borrowing 1,120. The total deduction is 2,920. Now, how much money you will get? What is the amount financed? 96,000 only, not 120,000. Okay? From 96,000, 2,920 amount is deducted. The remaining amount you will get here. This is the amount we are going to receive when we factor the receivables. And once, uh, one after one month, uh, uh, our factor collected from our customer we receive that remaining 20% from our factor. 120,000 times 20%. We'll receive 24,000 straight away. But getting this money in advance, the factor is charging you 2920, which includes 1,800 towards factor fee and 1,120 towards interest for one month. Okay, now sale of receivables. Now what we understand was uh, factoring of receivables. Factoring of receivables is different. Sale of receivables is different. Sale of receivable means we are selling outright. Outright means here in the case of factorer, what we do is factor, we get like 80% or 20%, 80% now and 20% when our factor collects a full payment from our customer. 
okay but sometimes we do not want to hold this amount for some time in that case what happens here once we receive an order from the customer okay we uh, say we see that customer is good or no customer is good then we approve the credit once a credit is approved then advance cash will be done then shipping the goods will take place then making the payment but for this reason what we do is we do not want all this we sell the goods to customer we sell the goods to the customer this is our company this is our customer and this is a factor but he will buy outright we sell the goods to customer goods to customer and we sell the receivables to factor company outright full amount say for example we sold goods to customer at 100000 we may sell the goods to factor at 95000 on the same day accounts receivable in our books will become zero because we are selling full receivables to a factor so factor will collect 100000 on due date that is his responsibility okay this is called sale of receivables we are not factoring it we are factoring means getting the loan on accounts receivable we are using it as security so there is no interest there is no fee or something then there will be only a difference amount how much he is going to buy that how much he is going to buy factory is going to buy depends upon conditions without recourse with recourse without recourse means if this customer cannot pay or does not want to pay or cannot pay to your factor you are not responsible at all so the purchaser of your receivables will assume the risk outright the see receivable is outrightly transferred okay only this 5000 will be recorded as loss in our books we write 95000 cash okay and uh, 5000 disposable charges then accounts receivable credit full amount is record. then completely you can forget this we can forget this why because it is without recourse if if our company sells the goods to our customer and customer does not pay to our factor if it does not pay we are no more responsible for that if we are responsible for that it is called recourse not responsible without recourse this is the difference okay so sale of receivables we charge the difference amount as you know collection charges or you know factoring charges or oh, sorry or disposable disposal charges then we just record it as you know um, uh, as cash received from like our customer with recourse means we guarantee that if our customer does not pay we'll pay you that amount with recourse so this is the end of uh, uh, our accounts receivable section wherein we discussed about how to present the receivables how to record the discount trade discount and cash discount we also learned how to you know account uh, allowance for doubtful debts using direct write off method allowance method and again in allowance method we discussed about uh, income statement approach allowance creation and balance sheet approach uh, allowance creation then we discussed about uh, um, factoring of receivables uh, disposal of receivables with recourse and without recourse this is the end of our session on accounts receivable we'll see in the next session uh, in the inventory hi uh, welcome to the session on inventory in which we'll discuss about measurement valuation and disclosure of short term items in the previous session we discussed about a short term item uh, accounts receivable now we'll discuss about inventory what is inventory inventory is a stock item purchased with an intention to sell inventory we buy 
to sell them off at a margin or we use in the production process in a manufacturing industry inventory can be raw materials in a retail industry inventory can be finished goods in uh, both the cases we need to have a proper inventory management system uh, by giving a restriction to only the access to restrictions by having a proper restrictions giving access to only the you know specified persons in the company uh, the high valued inventory ought to be okay given much importance uh, then we need to use some kind of you know uh, uh, um, security measures like having two-way mirrors security cameras security tags um, shop guards security guards etc now we have inventory in our showroom in our factory in our warehouse how do we you know control the inventory how do we control the inventory how do you record the inventory how do you supervise the inventory how do we issue the inventory to the showrooms and you know the factory what uh, uh, what methods of you know cost flow we use in our company like we'll discuss about five four life four first in first out last in first out average methods and their impact on our profits inventory then any errors takes place in the inventory that should also be accounted here the main objectives of inventory control include safeguarding of inventory because we are paying lots of money for inventory we have to safeguard it otherwise it will have it will have an impact on our profit not only that it is mandatory that it's a regulation that it has to be properly reported in financial statements at the end of each year so we need to record the uh, the uh, inventory values very clearly on the financial statements therefore we need to keep a record of all the documents which we use in the inventory from purchase to the consumption or sales the the first document what we get in the purchase process is purchase order purchase order specifies the supplier to supply certain goods on a certain date as per the agreed terms this is called po po stands for purchase order or local purchase order if it is locally made it becomes local purchase order locally made means both buyer or seller buyer and seller or is within the same country or city local purchase order so we pay we rise in an lpo stating that yes we are ready to buy these goods at a, in agreed prices agreed terms it's an approval from your side that you are ready to buy upon receiving this report the seller of the goods will arrange the goods and uh, uh, make arrangements to give delivery as per the agreed terms then you receive the inventory you have to store in the warehouse if it is a manufacturing company it will go to factory for production or if it is a trading company it will go to showroom for sale so uh, the document flow here you can observe what documents we used first we raised a local purchase order or a purchase order seller sends the goods to you along with invoice invoice specifies the description of the goods the price of the goods the amount of the goods tax if any etc etc right and also it sends a document called delivery order stating that what is the description of the goods and the quantity of the goods delivered so lpo is an authorization letter from us stating that we were ready to buy this inventory as per the agreed terms upon receiving lpo the supplier will supply the goods with the two documents invoice and delivery order upon upon receiving these two documents invoice will go to accounts receivable section of our company and do will go to receiving department of the inventory in our company so our company will receive two documents in two different places 
DO, for example, is received by a warehouse supervisor who is responsible for receiving and storing the inventory. So, DO is submitted to the receiving clerk in the warehouse. Whereas, the invoice is submitted in the office wherein our accounts receivable clerk will update this information as receivables. Oh, accounts payable. Sorry, accounts payable section. For your supplier, it's accounts receivable, but for us, it's an accounts payable section. So, accounts payable section will update the record for the value of goods received and amount due. Whereas, the clerk, receiving clerk, will receive the goods and prepare a note called GRN goods receipt note giving description of the goods received in what condition because devo mentions that what goods are delivered but what goods are received sometimes goods received may be different from uh, uh, the goods mentioned in the delivery note but condi uh, sometimes condition may be not uh, not good description may not be good or the, the the you know the goods may not be you know in a good condition good uh, 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 what we call performance uh, um, level or expired or broken so this need to be mentioned very clearly in goods receipt note so so far we have a document flow of lpo which is raised by us giving confirmation to the supplier for the purchase of goods invoice which is raised by the uh, supplier uh, at the time of delivery of the goods devo description of the goods for for the authentication to be given by the receiving clerk G, grn goods receipt note prepared by goods receiving clerk explaining the products received by comparing with the devo so we have these documents with us okay these documents with us now inventory is in the warehouse from inventory it will go either to the factory or to the showroom depending upon the nature of the business okay it if it is a manufacturing industry it will go to the material will go to factory for the production if it is a trading company it will go to showroom for sale so receiving report says that this in this in uh, inventory is in our control in our hand so this amount of inventory should be always available to either say for example in the case of trading company the showroom people should know that what amount of stocks we have in the warehouse so that they cannot take order based on that if it's a factory the factory production manager should be able to see that what is the inventory we have in the warehouse ready for ready for production so a physical inventory should also be tested from time to time whether the, the the report generated from the accounting department for the inventory and their quantities is same in the warehouse showroom and factory or not so we go for a verification we call it a stock taking whether the inventory levels are accurate or not as reported by the department here in the financial statements so this is what we call it as stock taking in this we uh, generate a report from accounts department um, or inventory department showing that this is a stock should exist as at a particular date then we physically verify the goods which is called stock trading or stock take stock taking So the inventory, as we discussed, consists of uh, finished goods in the case of uh, retail industry. And in the case of manufacturing industry, we have three different types of inventory. That is raw material, semi-finished goods, we call it as work in progress, and finished goods which are completed. So this is the inventory we maintain in a manufacturing industries. Whereas in the case of retail industries, we deal with only finished goods. And while purchasing the inventory, we may uh, have to record lots of subsequent expenses until you receive the goods. See, goods are available in which place? Supplier place. But goods are required to be stored in our place, either in the warehouse or in the showroom. 
So we'll have to move the goods from supplier place to our warehouse. We spend lots of expenses to move the goods. So all these costs should also be added back to inventory. Say for example, the total amount of goods you purchased is $10,000. You spent $2,000 to move the goods from supplier place to our warehouse, like loading, customs, insurance, shipping charges, offloading here, until now we paid $2,000. Now the inventory value should be taken as 12,000 but not 10,000. This is the value of the inventory you purchased. 10,000 which you paid to the supplier and 2,000 to expedite the material to receive in your warehouse. So the total value of inventory now is 12,000 but not 10,000. So for that reason what we need to do is you need to calculate total purchase price of the inventory. So purchase price of net cost of purchase price include purchase price which you paid to the supplier the 10,000 plus freight charges, shipping, transportation, uh, customs, then insurance etc. If you have any purchase returns in between that should be reduced. Any allowances and discounts received that should also be reduced. Then you will get net cost of purchases. This amount should be assigned to the inventory value not 10,000 here. If it is 10,000 purchase price you paid to the supplier is 10,000 you should not account only just 10,000. You should account all these amounts after adjusting this you will get net cost of purchases that should be accounted. When you purchase material when you purchase material from the supplier you will just record what inventory debit if it is on account means credit accounts payable credit if you are purchasing on credit otherwise you will write cash on account means credit you will have to use accounts payable against cash means instead of using accounts payable you should use cash because you are paying cash on that day now this inventory if you are working for a manufacturing industry going to be used in the production process the material what you purchase today is used in the production process so before that you might have some beginning inventory now recently purchased you will get some unused material from the purchased will get material used in the production material used in the production plus manufacturing expenses like factory expenses labor will give you manufacturing cost manufacturing cost beginning plus ending inventory of finished goods adjustment will give you cost of goods manufactured okay ending beginning finished goods will give you cost of goods sold so this will discuss in detail but at this moment direct material purchased how do you record it okay this is what our topic is this will dis discuss in detail in cost accounting topic at the moment we concentrate on cost of goods purchased so inventory we need to maintain uh, the inventory on regular basis not to have any shortage not to have in excess if you have a shortage of inventory you will lose a customer say for example a customer asks for five pieces of some items whose selling price is thousand and uh, your margin is twenty percent means if you sell this product you will get $200 per unit say for example you have only three pieces what is in shortage we have only three pieces we are in shortage of two pieces and customer buys only three pieces now if you had five pieces you would have sold all three pieces all five pieces and would have booked a profit of five pieces times 200 but you booked a profit of only three pieces times 200 that is 600 but two pieces times 200 you lost this margin because of non-availability of the goods you lost this margin this is called stock out cost stock out cost is not accounted in the books but it is a loss to us 
it's an opportunity which we lost okay if you had all five units you would have earned this much money so because we did not maintain the inventory level set a you know required level so we lost this margin or if you because of this if you store say for example 150 units not to have any shortage from next month onwards you might have bought or sold only 30 pieces but still 120 pieces are in your warehouse will give you lots of losses because of excess accumulative accumulation of inventory like storage cost theft accidents deterioration or expiry or the product becomes outdated etc so these are all called as you know the storing costs or carrying costs so if you have a shortage of goods you will lose a margin or if you have excess stock you will have more storage costs so not to have these two you need to maintain an optimal quantity in the inventory for this reason what we need to do is we need to have a inventory management systems most of the companies use perpetual inventory system which maintains a continuous history continuous record of inventory changes like in the previous case we supposed to have five pieces but we had only three pieces and we sold them by losing a margin on two pieces but if you have a system but if you have a system that when inventory levels fall to when inventory level falls to seven units we place a new order this is an indication okay so customer asked for five pieces we sold all five pieces okay all the five pieces not only that because we came to know that inventory levels now you know fall to fell to seven units we need to place an order we placed an order having still two units after selling to five units by the time you give delivery of these five units another you know five to ten units will be delivered so that your inventory levels will go up so we are monitoring this inventory by having a continuous record okay such a system is called as perpetual inventory system so there is a complete record maintained for the flow of inventory in and out so that we can maintain the inventory levels very healthily not having any surprises whereas periodic inventory system says you buy material you had 50 you purchase 150 total 200 you sell the goods you don't know only you know the sale how many units sold but you don't know how many units are left physically you should verify here or oh, 30 units are still there so we can say that 170 units are there sold and we'll have to see that how many units are sold 170 okay it's matching we depend on the ending inventory when we go for physical verification it is not suggested it is not suggested because we update the inventory periodically say weekly or monthly or quarterly then we come back and account it it is in reverse but in the case of perpetual inventory system our system says that uh, complete history yes this much stock you should have today then go and verify you will have that stock if there is any surplus shortage you need to reconcile then and there itself will uh, maintain the record continuously here it's not like that we go verify physically then you find what stock is there in the warehouse then we'll come back to calculate cost of goods sold how do you calculate cost of goods sold cost of goods sold equals to beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory this is always available in the case of per perpetual inventory system cost of goods sold perpetual inventory system because we are maintaining the regular record so it is always available how because we the moment when we purchase the inventory we debit inventory account beginning inventory was already there purchases 
debit inventory any freight etc all the expenses you you know pay to bring the material entire amount should go to one account called inventory we do not use the purchase purchases ledger but we write inventory account for all the amount purchased including purchase expenses then cost of goods sold will be credited cost of goods sold will be debited by crediting the inventory account how much you used beginning inventory plus purchases should be there so how many units are you know sold that will pick up cost of goods sold automatically because it is there in the system it is there in the system that what amount of inventory you purchased what was the beginning inventory and ending inventory system maintains every time so you can know that what is the cost of goods sold but in the case of periodic inventory system it is not like that so what we do here is we maintain individual accounts purchases account purchase account not inventory account like this method per freight account freight account debit bank account credit customs account debit bank account credit loading charges debit bank account credit we create individual accounts all right so when we create individual accounts it is difficult to calculate cost of goods sold what you need to do is we need to take up all the purchase account balance plus all the direct expenses you spend to purchase minus you need to find out the ending inventory ending inventory this beginning inventory plus purchase value plus all the expenses then physical verification what inventory we have in the warehouse okay this is to be found system doesn't give you whereas in the perpetual inventory system system gives on daily basis this beginning inventory purchases expenses will give you cost of goods available for sale cost of goods available for sale we want to calculate cost of goods sold so you need to find out ending inventory and deduct from cost of goods available for sale to get cost of goods sold it's a very tedious job periodic inventory method is a tedious job and we do not have control over the inventory having this therefore always we should suggest the perpetual inventory system so when you when you purchase the inventory when you purchase the inventory the inventory ownership will go to the supplier uh, from from the supplier to the customer depending upon the the you know the title which you use say for example goods are on the way goods are on the way now this is a supplier place this is a buyer's place there is a transaction going on between these two gentlemen now who becomes owner is an issue when goods are in transit on the way okay so the terms are very very important the purchase terms are very very important these terms are called as international commercial terms in simple we call them as inco terms international commercial terms these terms are issued by international chamber of commerce international chamber of commerce issues this commercial terms which the importers exporters buyers and sellers should know say for example fob shipping point fob shipping point means shipping point is this place in x country this is country y okay and both of them agreed for 50 dollars per unit and the price is fob shipping point the moment supplier moved the goods up to shipping point the responsibility of the supplier is over the entire risk is now transferred to buyer buyer has to bear the risk of transfer of the goods from shipping point at supplier place to his warehouse so risk is now transferred to the buyer okay this when use this term in the uh, uh, contract 
FOB shipping point $50. Whereas if you say FOB destination point means it has to goods have to reach the buyer's place. So buyer is in safety and supplier has to move the goods up to buyer's shipping point area destination area so literally the supplier will have to move the goods from his country to buyer's country and deliver the goods it's a destination point as specified in the contract so the entire risk is with the with the supplier seller so the ownership will be transferred at this point until here ownership is with the seller if something happens for the goods during this period seller has to bear it whereas in the case of fob shipping point if something happens to the goods at this point buyer has to bear why because buyer has become owner at shipping point itself the risk is already transferred to buyer at shipping point at supplier place i hope you understand this and will continue in the next session have a good day.